Oracle is set to be announced as TikTok's tech partner. At the heart of the TikTok and Oracle deal is whether TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance should remain the main stakeholder of the app. ByteDance can have no role within TikTok if we're going to protect Americans' data. The Chinese Communist Party has been collecting private information of celebrities, royalties, and politicians in the UK and Australia. What do they need this data for? China seeks to become the Saudi Arabia of data. They can use that to influence not only their own people, but also to influence the rest of the world. This is the power. At a time when the Chinese regime is becoming more aggressive in big data and artificial intelligence, my interview with Robert Spaulding, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, we discussed what it takes to protect American citizens and why is communist China against the rudimental premise of our democracy. This is really the convergence of technology and warfare for the 21st century. Please subscribe to our channel for the special election coverage this month. This interview and many others will be part of a documentary that will be released on YouTube in October to expose the CCP's meddling in our election, their big data and AI ambition, and how it endangers the foundation of the American democracy. Thank you, General, for being with us today. Great to be back. Thank you. So uh, first of all, let's talk about TikTok. TikTok has 80 to 100 million active users in the US. I think uh, the terms uh, TikTok in trying to work with uh, Oracle, part of the term is uh, if ByteDance, TikTok's Chinese parent company, remains to be the main stakeholder of the company and Oracle uh, hosts TikTok's data and oversees the security operations of the app. Do you think that, that would be an acceptable arrangement? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So first of all, ByteDance can have no role within TikTok if we're going to protect Americans' data. Furthermore, TikTok as a platform is essentially a data vacuum. It's for collecting data that then gets um, driven into algorithms that allow for the platform to influence you. It really reads your sentiment based on all the data that's collected and the algorithms that that's run through. And so allowing any tech company to have that capability, I think is also wrong for our democracy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that it's the Chinese Communist Party that controls TikTok through ByteDance, but it's also that all this data is collected to influence you. And that should be something that we need to have controls on, certainly not just laws, but also in terms of technology. So to protect your data from being used to influence you in ways that are counter to your own interests without you knowing it. And also the ethics of those big American tech companies. Oracle, Cisco, Microsoft, all these companies have helped or are still helping the Chinese Communist Party to build a police state. Um, I think Oracle is a big helper uh, for the Ministry of Public Security to build their Golden Shield project. So even if Oracle takes total control of the data, we still can't trust Oracle, right? Well, this whole idea of you know, enabling the Chinese uh, national security state, the ability to control their population through technology, is something that we should have never allowed as a country. And certainly that's what Silicon Valley is fighting for. That's what these technology companies are fighting for, the ability to continue to enable the authoritarianism and totalitarianism of the Chinese Communist Party. That's totally natural in our society where business and government are separate and there's a there's a, the, a free economy. So the challenge is, you know, the people that run Oracle have a fiduciary responsibility towards the shareholders, towards the people that, um, you know, essentially invest in Oracle and therefore they must do things to increase profits. Mm -hmm. So there is this, there is this disconnect be between this need to um, get profits for your company and the, uh, and the need to uphold the values, principles, and interests of the United States as a country and as a society. And so that's where the Chinese Communist Party's power lies in the ability to influence companies through the profit motive to undermine the interests of the American people. 
And the reason that didn't happen during the Cold War and the reason we were able to defeat the Soviet Union was because we didn't allow this profit motive to occur that would enable the Soviet Union to undermine the United States because the same thing would have happened. So our, our blindness, our real ignorance was really believing in the idea that the Chinese Communist Party would not use this profit motive to undermine our national interests. And of course, now we know that they, that's everything they do. You know, from the operational perspective, I talked to the Huawei expert about this prospect of uh, Oracle uh, owning part of the company oversees uh, the, the, you know, oversees the security operation, oversees our coding and everything. And he said, as long as uh, ByteDance is still a, a main stakeholder, their uh, technician, Chinese technicians are still writing the code, their managers are overseeing the daily operation, and they are participating in the decision making, risks cannot be eliminated at all. I mean, the Chinese, no matter how, how, how good the deal looks like on the surface, do you agree? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that you think about with these technology companies in terms of how does the Chinese Communist Party do what they do? One is to have, you know, their employees, Chinese nationals, have access to either the underlying code or the equipment that where this um, where these um, the software runs. That's one way to to use a person to you know uh, you know ostensibly doing work for the company, but to really be doing work for the state. That's one way. Mm -hmm. The other way is that the Chinese Communist Party understands the source code, understands all the technology, understands how it's put together, and therefore understands where all the vulnerabilities are. That's another way. And so by allowing the Chinese Communist Party to have any you know, interest whatsoever, whether it's in understanding the technology or it is in allowing people to actually physically touch the code or the hardware where the um, code runs, it's all vulnerable. And so I think to really make it secure, not only do, does there need to be a clean break between the Chinese Communist Party and TikTok, but there has to be also a rethinking of the TikTok data collection engine where data security, privacy, data sovereignty are built into the model. Mm -hmm. If they are not, because in essence, China built the engine, the software engine, they're going to know where the vulnerabilities are, and they're still going to be able to take data out. That's their that's their um, process. It's the same thing, by the way, that happens in 5G. Mm -hmm. If China it has access to the source code or the equipment that things are run on, it doesn't matter if it's Huawei or another company that's not Chinese. If they understand the underlying technology, if they understand the source code, then they understand the vulnerabilities, and therefore they can take data out. So that's why... Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said five claims, right? Uh, only if you have five claims, clean internet, a clean uh, device, clean, uh, I don't remember all the claims. So only by doing that you can expel the Chinese communist uh, element out of your system and you can be safe. Yeah, because if you think about it today, we are building a common framework and architecture for the global internet. And that's because Chinese companies work side by side with American companies to develop the standards and the underlying technology that makes everything compatible. That's, it, that's the global internet. The challenge with that is, is that the Chinese Communist Party has access to the entire thing, right? And so in, on page 19 of the National Security Strategy, it says we're going to build a nationwide secure 5G network. And this is implying we're going to have a clean break. We're going to create an internet that protects the American people's data, protects their privacy. This is something that's peculiar to American democracy. In fact, it's counter, completely counter to Chinese totalitarianism. And so we have tended to think about the world in terms of geography, right. land, and military. And what the national security strategy says is that data and artificial intelligence are far more important in being able to change the underlying fabric of societies. This is why the Chinese Communist Party built the Great Firewall, the recognition that the Chinese people could somehow be infected with the ideas of democracy. So they, they understand the power of the internet to 
uh, promote narratives, promote values and principles. So their goal is to basically control that process so that they can create a global uh, society that is um, essentially acceptable to the Chinese Communist Party leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2017, Xi Jinping said, uh, big data and AI are the most important national resources for China. This is in 2017. And he said, in 2025, uh, China will be able to catch up on big data and AI with America. And by 2030, China will lead the world. So what do you think is China's vision in this area? And what do they try to accomplish with big data and AI? So first of all, I'm pretty sure that Xi Jinping doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to big data and AI. But what happened was, uh, and Kai-Fu Lee talked about this in his book, AI Superpower, mm -hmm. AlphaGo, which okay. was an AI machine, okay. beat the best Go player in the world. And that shocked the Chinese Communist Party. And they said, okay, this is a very important technology. We must dominate it. In order to dominate AI, you must dominate data. So Kai Fu Lee says that China seeks to become the Saudi Arabia of data. Mm -hmm. So think about the entire world's data and collection of that data as being tantamount to having power over the world. This is the way that the Chinese Communist Party sees the global internet, globalization, our connectedness. That's why Xi Jinping goes to Davos and says we must work together, we must you know, continue globalization, we must continue this global connectivity because it enables them to take the data into China behind the Great Firewall, create this huge data ocean that then their uh, artificial intelligence can learn from. So this is, their, this is their goal because they know that they can use that just like TikTok is used as a platform to influence. They can use that to influence not only their own people to basically not know the true history of China, but also to influence the rest of the world. This is the power that, quite frankly, we built. Silicon Valley built this power. Mm -hmm. We built it and made hundreds, trillions of dollars. The Chinese Communist Party saw that and said, not only do we want to have control over that economic engine, we want to have the ability to uh, influence socially and politically as well. This is a, really the convergence of technology and warfare mm -hmm. for the 21st century. And I think that's already happening. Look at what the Chinese Communist Party has been collecting, private information of uh, you know, high-profile celebrities, uh, royalties, or, or politicians in UK and Australia. What do they need those data for? Well, the, the data is really to figure out ways to influence people that they want to influence. You know, I talk to people all the time. They say, why should the Chinese Communist Party care about what I do on my phone? And I, you know, in my book, Stealth War, we talk about Roy Jones, who was working for the Marriott Corporation that liked to tweet about Tibet and ended up being fired. Mm. So the point is that as you collect this data, you, you understand how you can influence or censor or otherwise create advantage for yourself, you know, in, in terms of the Chinese Communist Party. Then you, you, when you have that, and then you add over the course of time when people become a problem for the regime, their ability to influence those people in ways that benefit the regime is what they're after. And so slowly there's a, there's a process of essentially creating accept, widespread acceptance for the, the, what the regime does, whether it's you know, imprisoning in a million Uyghurs, whether it's doing uh, forced organ harvesting, where the, whether it's, you know, um, you know uh, oppressing the Falun Gong, any of these things they want to create acceptance for. And so having control over this data enables them to not only understand people's sentiments, but also begin to slowly change those sentiments. You just talked about uh, China wants to be Saudi Arabia with big data. Do you think the American leader have realized how important big data and AI are? Well, it took a while, right? This, the national security strategy came out in December of 2017. It, it clearly said this. But taking that strategy and implementing it in a way that protects the American people required a number of 
agencies and departments within the federal government and really you know within the the beltway of dc the national security establishment to be able to recognize the power of silicon valley the power that they have to influence and i think now with this what's going on with wechat and with tiktok you see a convergence between that strategy and a recognition of the importance of implementing it in ways that protect data privacy data security, data sovereignty, these are keys to democracy in the 21st century. If you do not have them, then tech companies and governments become all powerful over the, either the users or the citizens. And so in order to reestablish balance, to give the individual power in a society, in, a, in, a, in an advanced 21st century, digitally powered society, you have to give them control over their data. The interesting thing is that, you know, people are starting to recognize that, you know, this Edward Snowden guy was saying this. Now, whether you agree or disagree with what he did, the fundamental premise for the idea that your privacy, your data security is key to our democracy, I think is the part that's enshrined in the current national security strategy. It is about protecting not just the physical borders of America, it is about protecting who you are as an individual in digital space. I was going to ask you how much influence, how much control does the national security, uh, national security establishment in Washington DC have in control in Silicon Valley, but uh, it seems like what you're talking about is um, even the government shouldn't have too much control over private information. I mean, the, the, uh, when it comes down to it, it should be the individual has control over their privacy and, and data, not the big tech companies, not the government either. Not any government. And, and really, if you think about it, if you go back to the founding of America and you read the Federalist Papers, you understand the Constitution, the entire premise behind the American experiment is that you could create a government where no person, party, group could gain ultimate power. It, power is diffuse. It's separated. There's three branches of government. There's controls. There's, there's oversight. There's a recognition in the Founding Fathers that you cannot trust humanity not to want to oppress, right? Whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, their, their, their goal is to be in charge of everything and to force the other side to you know, do the things that they want them to do. That is, that is part of humanity. And so they try to create this experiment. Can we create a government where nobody can gain power? They didn't foresee the internet, right? Mm -hmm. So what they said was, if this experiment fails, we want to make sure that the people who have this pre-existing right to defend their you know, freedom have the ability to you know, fight against an oppressive government. That's the Second Amendment that gives you the right to keep and bear arms. Again, they didn't envision the internet because if they had, they would recognize as, as the internet comes into, um, into play and you can be influenced without your knowledge, in ways that are counter to your own interests, then you begin to really realize that we've grown into a world where the gun is really irrelevant because if you don't know you're being oppressed or you don't know who your oppressor is, what good is a gun? It, it really has no meaning in our, in our world today. And so you have to step back and say, how do we reassert that balance to prevent tech companies and governments from gaining ultimate power mm -hmm over people, and that's really about data security, encryption, data sovereignty, privacy, your ability to make sure that your data is only yours, and you share it on the basis of trust with either the government or other companies or individuals because you have that ability to control it. We haven't built that into our internet. We never anticipated that big data and artificial intelligence would have the power over people, the power to influence you in ways that are counter to your own interests. That wasn't anticipated, not by government, not by, certainly was by some technologists, but they were generally not listened to. And so now it's important that the government, and we're talking about a government where less than 1% of any congressman or senator, 
or has ever you know studied computer science or any or any technology. They're not technology people. That's they're in politics because that's what they wanted to do. But it takes an understanding of the technology that underlies our current state, our current environment. If you don't understand that, then you can't apply policies that force that technology to go in ways that promote our democracy. So this is really about reestablishing the foundations of democracy for a digital world in ways that are absolutely aligned with what the founding fathers had in mind for our system, which is nobody, no company, no individual, no government can gain ultimate power because ultimately what you see is if that happens, just like with the Communist Party, you end up with, you know, if you don't agree, you end up with a bullet in the back of your head because the government says, no, you're going to do what we want you to do because we are supporting our own interests, not yours. It seems like the Silicon Valley has been out of control for a while. So the question is, how much reign does the national security establishment have on the Silicon Valley? None. Zero. In fact, uh, Silicon Valley despises the national security establishment. Now, there's a few people that have worked within um, government, but what happens is many of them are entrepreneurs or people that think outside of the box. And of course, what you find when you come to Washington D.C. is it abhors you know people that think outside of the box. They want conformity and they want you to be bureaucratic. So they don't tend to last very long, and they don't tend to make much headway because in order to actually innovate in government, you have to have patience. You have to be wily, and you have to kind of figure out. Where is the way that you can actually make um, you know, progress happen? There's not a lot of people that are willing to do that um, because they get frustrated um, by the bureaucracy. So yeah, I mean, there's no understanding or control um, of the national security establishment over, <laughs> over Silicon Valley. That's our problem. We've disconnected the people that basically make it their life's work to protect the nation from the tools that are needed to actually do that. Right? They have the tools of the military, right? Those are the tools they play with, ships and planes and the tanks. Right. The tools of data, those are controlled by Silicon Valley. That's the difference. Now we created this thing called the Global Engagement Center in the State Department. It was meant to kind of be able to take the control of data and use it in ways that promote American interests, but it ran into quickly our legal system that says you cannot collect data on people. Because if you don't have data, you can't actually drive algorithms that give you uh, understanding and, and help you create the types of tools that enable you to fix the problem. And so um, it's really about uh, you know, re-fashioning um, the ability of Silicon Valley to have control over data and use it ways that are counter to our interests and then do the same thing with the Chinese Communist Party because both are un unhealthy for our democracy. But I think the Silicon Valley is probably happy to keep the status quo. Yeah, that's where they make their money. It's such a tough and complicated task. When you said we need to de develop a, a whole uh, way of uh, thinking or policies in this uh, uh, digital world, uh, lay out the foundation for a democratic society in this digital world. So I think there are two things needs to be done. The lawmaker, statesman needs to understand technology. But on the other hand, we live in this complicated world. If you want to solve any specific problem, it's almost like you have to go very deep to go to the foundations. What, what it takes to be a human? What, what do we, why do we live in this world? What is government for? All these things needs to be considered, right? Absolutely. That's why I've spent you know, the last two years of my life focusing deep on the technology. Because I think if we don't fix the technology, um, we're not going to be able to get out of this mess. It doesn't matter. The laws aren't going to protect us from Facebook. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, the lawmakers don't understand how Facebook works, the, how that use of data is translated into influence. They're, that's not something that they're going to be able to control. You have to understand the technology first, and then you have to build in the controls into the technology. And it has to be in a way that it can't be manipulated from outside hands. So these are things that can be done, uh, in some cases have been done, they just haven't been done at scale. They haven't been done at scale to protect democracy. 
That's what the national security strategy is about, is changing the way we think about technology, how it interacts with our social and political spheres and economic, and then try to create the policies that will force those changes in technology in ways that benefit, benefit and promote the continuation of our democratic republic. So I'm just going to say not many people are doing the work, the important work you are doing. Not enough people. Yeah, there's a convergence here, I think, of technology and policy and the foundations and framework for um, democracy. If it's going to survive into the 21st century, it requires us to get much deeper into the underlying technology. Kind of like the Founding Fathers got deep into, you know, what are the governments that have in, been in existence over recorded history? How have they worked? How have they not worked? How have they su survived? How have they failed? How have they collapsed? What should we construct? Just like that, the very um, the thought and care that went into, you know, creating the American experiment. It's time for us to do that in technology because otherwise we will not have consistency. We will have the idea of America, but the ability to execute that idea will become less and less you know, positive. We will lose that ability to promote our democracy going forward. When one voice can shout louder and become the voice that represents everybody, but it only represents in reality a, f a favored few, then this is completely you know, counter to the ideals of America. So yes, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people, first of all, there's not a lot of people that understand the underlying technology of our current world. Even people that work inside that, part of the problem of Silicon Valley is it's become less and less about technology and more about how do you make business, how do you make money very quickly using this technology? And that is how do I take data and use it to you know, make a lot of money? This idea of, remember what I said about profit, you know, allowing this ability to influence. The same thing is with data because it is such an attraction in Silicon Valley and, and it leads to enormous valuations for companies. Many people rush in to try to figure out what's the next unicorn I can create in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. That does not promote innovation that drives a better, more democratic future. Mm -hmm. It's really just about how to make money on the current system. And the current system is flawed in ways that we've been talking about. It's meant for profit. It's meant for power. It's meant for control. And if you think about it, all of those ideas are completely counter to our country. But what country currently actually most closely represents power, profit, and control? It's the Chinese Communist Party. So it's perfectly aligned with that society. If you look today, look at global data protection regulation, because there's a, there's a, there's a neutral party, right? Global data protection regulation in the EU was about promoting privacy and data security and data sovereignty for the people of Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have two sides to that coin now. You have the Facebook, Amazon, Google side, where Google goes over and gets fined $57 million in Europe, but if they're making a billion dollars, they'll just pay the fine and keep doing things. Now you have the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent side, which doesn't pay a fine and just keeps doing what they want to do anyway. So you have to understand that laws are insufficient to promote the kind of outcomes we need. Those, that has to be translated into the technology as it's built itself. So we're talking about don't build Huawei here, don't build Huawei there. That is not sufficient. Actually rethinking the underlying architecture and the underlying technology of our telecommunications networks at us are, of our computing platforms in a way that promotes democratic principles. This is what we're talking about. So it requires you to understand first and foremost that no, no organization, person, or group can be trusted to have power. That's, what, that's a clear lesson that comes out of the American experiment. And then how do we disenable that from happening in this technology matrix we live in. That's where technology and policy come together to create a new understanding of how do you promote national security in the 21st century. And that's where I think you have people that are good at the technology, there's people that are good at the policy and the understanding, but to your point, they have to put it together in a whole package to allow them 
allow us to be able to build the kinds of systems and laws and regulations that actually work together to promote our democracy. And we are far from that ideal state that you are talking about. Yes, but I see in WeChat banning, I see in the banning of tic, future banning of TikTok, I see a movement, a recognition that it needs to happen. Okay. But as you know, it, it can't happen up here. You have to go deep down into understanding things. So you are talking craft. about uh, within the Trump administration, there are technical, deeply technical people understand what the Silicon Valley is doing, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, and can come up with those sensible policies that target the right, I mean, aim the right target. I'm not saying that. I'm saying now that they recognize the problem. Okay. The next step, so it's not, it's not sufficient just to ban the Chinese Communist Party. That doesn't, that's not gonna get us there. You also have to take that and, and rebuild the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's a recognition of what we have to do, but what you're talking about is how do we do it? That requires you to be absolutely clear about how the technology is put together. Yeah. That is where we're, we're not there yet, okay? We're at the recognition that we need to do something differently. But getting down into the technology and, and, and uh, reconfiguring the way that our digital system works requires engineers and scientists. If you think about it, it's also um, you know, aligned with what's happened since the end of the Cold War, which was we stopped spending on science and technology. Telecommunications companies were putting together networks that benefited their profit line, but weren't innovative in terms of how they worked with regard to data security. So you have to begin to use more of the government's money. So now we're spending eight hundred billion dollars a year on defense, but we buy things like F thirty fives and aircraft carriers and nuclear powered submarines, none of which protects us from outside influence. Mm -hmm. Some of that money has to go into, okay, let's how do we, let's invest in science and technology. Let's reconfigure the internet in a way that promotes data security and data sovereignty. And then let, let's build that into our infrastructure in the United States. In, in the Cold War, the United States built the uh, Eisenhower National Highway System. Major Eisenhower, you know, drove across the country and, you know, got stuck in the mud along the way and realizes in order to you know advance this country both from a national security perspective but also from an economic perspective we needed a highway system to connect the, the, the society mm -hmm. the idea in the national security strategy is we need a digital highway system right. for the 21st century but that protects the data of the american people because it doesn't matter if you protect the borders if you know, you can go right into your home and influence your children. So I'm a B-2 pilot. I was trained to fight for my country to impose the nation's will on an adversary using bombs. What the Chinese Communist Party have figured out how to do is while I'm off fighting in another place, they come right to my home and begin to change my kids into appreciating communism more, to appreciate the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party. So in a, in, in a way, America built the Maginot Line. We built this perfect military that was designed to protect uh, our geography. And the Chinese Communist Party just came around with a blitzkrieg of information, just like the Nazis did with the French, and have begun to erode our society. Now it's a slow erosion. We have time to stop it, and we can stop it. But we have to understand that you know, the way we've thought about protecting our people is not the way that the Chinese Communist Party chooses to fight a globalized, internet-connected world. Mm -hmm. Talking about the Chinese Communist Party's erosion in the Western society, in America society, I mean, we have been uh, focusing on you know, what the Chinese Communist Party has done, you know, their intentions, their true motives, and and this and that. But I wonder uh, if one of the big reasons um, the Chinese Communist Party can make such big erosion in America is also because the, the, the great values, the, the things that has been holding the Western civilizations have declined. Well, that's been purposeful. 
there has been a movement, particularly within the social sciences um, in the West, that have tended to you know, create this uh, new theory around something that's called applied postmodernism. And it's really a rejection of the scientific method of logic and reason uh, for a more of an idea that language um, is equivalent to power. In other words, the things you say um, justifies the way you think, and that's where your knowledge comes from. And so there's a belief in social science today that you know, the Enlightenment period, the period of logic and reason and of, um, and of the scientific method of, you know, evaluating and then assessing based on that evaluation and coming to a conclusion about your world around you. You know, an apple falls at 32 feet per second per second squared. That, that comes out of that period where we're actually using logic and reason to understand the world around us and not um, superstition. Applied postmodernism aggressively attacks that, attacks the scientific method, attacks logic and reason, and says that no, that system was concocted for, to, to promote the established power base. It is about language that talks about power. It's about controlling the narrative that controls the way um, the society is um, aligned. Well, if you look at it, this is exactly what the Chinese Communist Party does, right? So what's happened is, at the same time the Cultural Revolution was going on in China, you were also having a revolution in Western academia saying, let's, let's discard the scientific method, let's discard logic and reason, and let's, let's take on the mantle of Confucius. Because Confucius says, when he's asked, what would be the first thing when, that you would do if you were made emperor? Of course, I would rectify the names. It's about controlling the narrative, controlling the way people talk, because it is, it is tantamount to controlling the way they think. Epistemology, the source of knowledge. This is what academia today, particularly in the social sciences in the West, focuses on. How, why do we think the way we think? It's more about language, and it's not about thought and reason. That's a very dangerous place to be in, because it puts us right in alignment with what the Chinese Communist Party wants, which is, it's not logic or reason, it is the Chinese Communist Party control of the narrative that drives the power structures of our global society. Not just the Chinese society, the global society. This is a very, very dangerous thing for democracies if we're, if we're walking away from the scientific method and logic and reason, and we're going to narratives. You've seen that with the, the recent coronavirus. It's about promoting narratives. It's not about promoting science. And so whoever shouts loudest, or even if you ban somebody for ha coming out with a scientific report that you disagree with, rather than having a peer review, having repeatability, right? You, you, you do an experiment, you have an outcome, if that cannot be repeated, then the scientific method said that has no validity. But it's the ability to repeat, repeat the outcomes of an experiment that leads to better understanding of our world. That's the scientific method. That is not the method that either the social sciences in the, in the Western world or the Chinese Communist Party wants. They want the ability to control the narrative and therefore control the way uh, you think. And guess what? Data, artificial intelligence, Silicon Valley, the Chinese machine have all you know, been built to do just exact, exactly that, control the narrative. So you see the, the, the um, slow erosion of the principles and values of democracy in the United States because we, the, during the 60s and 70s, at the same time that the Cultural Revolution was going on, to do the same thing in China, it was happening in the West. We just didn't have the technology and the connectiveness to put the two together. That's what, that's what you know, Chao Liang and, uh, and Wang Shangsui figured out. We, the globalization and the internet gave the Chinese Communist Party the power to take the tools and the ideas that were forming in the West and begin to reshape our conception of liberty and freedom in a globalized, internet-connected world. And people in America are just starting to realize that, I think. So the question I want to ask you is, uh, what do you think is the, I mean, what do you think is the biggest strength America still has today over China? 
the Constitution. I think the Constitution as an idea, as a foundation for how to build a society, a blueprint, if you will, for how to build a human society where you have human frailty and you have to deal with it and you have to ensure that that you, the way you deal with that is to ensure that no human or humans can have ultimate power. I think that is the strength of America. If we are true to that strength and we, we recognize what's happening as a people, then we're going to do the right things to, to, to take the underlying technology of our, of our 21st century existence and we're going to craft a system that preserves those principles. I mean, that's really, we're nearing 250 years as a nation. And typically that's the, the time when you start to see nations fall apart. So that's a real critical time in our history. The selection is critical. Our, our, our total existence as a free society where people are allowed to live as they want and reach their true present, potential is at risk from the tools that we ourselves built and the Chinese Communist Party have appropriated and begun to you know, use extensively to undermine our, our, our society. So are you confident that we can win this battle between the American Republic versus the CCP? I am absolutely confident. I, if you go back to the founding of this country, it wasn't everybody that decided, hey, we wanted a free country. It was a few. It was a determined few that were not going to be subjugated, that they were going to stand up for their rights and they were going to find other people that were like-minded and they were going to work together to build this new land. And those people exist today. We just have not been fighting together. So yes, absolutely, we can win. We just have to stand up and fight. Fighting together, Democrats and Republicans. Absolutely. Well, General, thank you so much.